I used to rule the world. Seas would rise when I gave the word. Now in the morning I sleep alone, sweep the streets I used to own. I used to roll the dice, feel the fear in my enemy's eyes, listen as the crowd would sing, now the old king is dead. Long live the king. One minute I held the key. Next the walls were closed on me. I discovered that my castles stand upon pillars of salt, pillars of sand. If you pass in front of a Home Depot in the early morning, you might see some of them, men, usually with a pair of work gloves, hoping that a contractor or a homeowner will hire them for the day. Sometimes they're lucky, they get picked up quickly. Sometimes they wait and wait and end up hanging out just to snag a few hours of work. Sometimes they go home empty-handed. Not because they didn't want to work, because there was no work for them. And yet they will go home to the same home they left, a home that will often include mouths to feed, rent to pay, even as that home might have two, three, four, even five times the number of people in it than my house, or maybe yours. And for many, the tendency is to think, well, they're migrant workers. That is their lot in life. But while the truth I'm about to share doesn't make the situation any better or less tragic, sometimes that's not the whole story. About 15 years ago, a man from Egypt appeared at church. He was not looking for a handout. He needed help. He was an electrical engineer, a highly skilled, degreed professional in the land of his birth. He was a Christian, a Coptic, Christian, and he had run because of oppression and danger in his country. He had been able to come to America, but found that the language barrier made getting a job in his profession impossible. He was looking for anything, anything at all. Today, he would likely be standing in front of Home Depot. But all I could do back then was help him with his resume. Right now, the horrible situation in Afghanistan is in our viewfinders. How many of those folks who managed to escape will be coming here to a similar situation? My point is we look at those workers at Home Depot, but what do we really see? Do we really see the whole picture? Or do we make our assumptions, perhaps let our prejudice control our thoughts and figure, well, they should have known better. They should have done better. They should have stayed home. But it's not always that easy. We understand the situation our, our Afghan brothers and sisters are in. We even feel responsible for it. But a lot of folks from a lot of places come here to avoid being caught on the wrong end of a gun. I quoted the song from Coldplay today because that's the position a lot of them probably feel like they've landed in, like life was good, even beautiful, like they had control of their little portion of it, a portion that felt like the world to them, and then it fell apart. Now in the morning I sleep alone, sweep the streets I used to own. One minute I held the key, next the walls were closed on me. I discovered that my castles stand upon pillars of salt, pillars of sand. And as much as we like to complain, sometimes with good reason, few of us know of such a perilous existence or what it's like to see with the eyes of one who has never been able to gain stability or who has fallen to the point where they're sweeping the streets that they once could have owned a house on. Today from Jesus, we have the parable of the workers of the vineyard. Men gathered at the marketplace, the Home Depot of that time, hoping to get a job for the day to earn a day's wage, which is what you needed to feed a family in the time of Jesus. And the landowner goes out and he hires men early, promising that wage. 
But then he goes back about noon and finds other men still waiting because nobody's hired them. So he sends them, too, to his place. Likewise, he does this two more times. The last time at five in the afternoon, he hires these men whom no one else has touched. And what does the landowner do at the end of the day? We all know. Because most of us, we kind of hate this parable. Don't tell Jesus. The landowner pays them all the same. And not surprisingly, the men who were there all day, through the heat of the day, have something to say. That's not fair. But what does the landowner say? You got what I promised you. My money is mine to give. Are you giving me the evil eye? And by the way, that's how the Greek reads. Are you giving me the evil eye because you don't think I have the right to be generous with what is mine? Take what belongs to you and go. And the last are first and the first are last. And so on. The justice of the landowner is not the justice we, at least instinctually, would employ. And of course, we all know who the landowner represents. As you've probably heard me mention before, as I've already alluded to, this parable never makes the list of favorite stories of Jesus, even as one of the real favorites, the prodigal son, features a character who comes to work for the father rather late in the day and who, much worse, has already wasted a whole bunch of his father's money. And this kid gets the royal treatment. The royal treatment his much more loyal brother deserved. We like that parable. This one not so much. But sometimes what we don't like has the most to teach us. I think part of our survival instincts include the tendency, if not the need, to see others as less than human. Some of this is understandable. We can't watch the news, much less the suffering around us, without putting up something of a wall between those who are suffering and ourselves. If we feel for all of them completely from the depth of our souls, we're not going to be able to function. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't feel for them. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't consider the reality of their situation. The parable tells us that those workers at Home Depot, those laborers late to the vineyard, would find generosity and mercy from the landowner and one day will find it from God because that's what they need. And God, Jesus, was always about what a person needed. Jesus never raised a question if the loaves and fish, the mercy, the forgiveness, the healing was deserved. He didn't feed just a little to a person who was sorta of good. He didn't give just a little mercy or forgiveness to someone who was sorta of okay. He didn't heal halfway based on job performance. His grace, his justice, was complete because it was based in love. And love looks at what a person needs. And if we look at our own lives and honestly assess who we are as people, we can thank God for that. Because our job performance often leaves something to be desired. Our castles stand on pillars of salt, pillars of sand. We can thank God that God loves and is less than concerned with the time clock when we punched in or out. Can we live in mercy? Can we be more generous, more accepting? Can we be more like the landowner? It starts in the heart. Well, actually sometimes it starts in action because
action can get the heart to follow. If you just do it, if you live mercy, justice, love, even if you're not feeling it, the heart will follow. It will catch up. Action will teach the heart to catch up. Remember, we're loved. Remember, love is why we are given grace. Share that love with others. It will change our hearts. It will teach us what is really important.